This podcast is about introducing our fans to the animals, plants, and other products that we work with at Josh's Frogs. It's an opportunity to paint a picture of our hobby that is refreshing. We want you guys to be successful with the animals that you're keeping, and we want our hobby to grow ethically and sustainably into the future. Welcome to the Josh's Frogs podcast. Uh, today I'm here with uh, Brandon. We're going to talk about shield tails. Uh, but before we do that, I want to let you know that the Josh's Frogs podcast is brought to you by Josh's Frogs, where your one stop shop for all your reptile, amphibian, and pet bug needs. So we do all the captive breeding here at our facility here in Michigan. And then we carry everything you need to take care of these animals. So from caging to substrates to hides to lighting to heating, all that kind of stuff. And then we also carry all the live plants you need for those animals, um, as well as all the feeder bugs uh, that you need uh, to take care of those. Um, we offer a seven-day health guarantee on all of our animals um, and then a 72-hour live arrival guarantee on all of our insects. Uh, we can ship insects, plants, and your terrarium all in one uh, order because um, it's all coming from our place here in Michigan. Um, so we're here to take care of you um, on the customer service side. We have agents available to answer your questions. And then we have an exhaustive uh, how-to library um, and a bunch of YouTube videos. We just want you to, to feel confident that you can take care of these uh, cool animals. So check us out, joshesfrogs.com. Uh, Thanks a lot. Without further ado, welcome back, Brandon. Uh, you've been on a few of these already, but uh, kind of remind us, what do you what do you do here at Josh's Frogs yep. and how long you've been doing it? Uh, I've been here since around May uh, 2021. Um and uh, for the majority of my time here, I've been our arid reptile caretaker. So that's um, and that's exactly what uh, I'm here to talk to you today is about one of my favorite species in the room. Awesome, awesome. Well, tell us about that species. What's a shield tail? Tell us what those are, and and kind of maybe even compare and contrast it to some other lizards that are yeah. Common uh, the shield tail agama. Uh, they're also called strange tail agama. Um, strange tail. I like that. <laughs> uh, scientifically referred to as as an agama taylori. Uh, it's a relatively new genus, actually. I forget exactly what genus they used to be assigned to, but there was some work done recently, and now there's a tiny little uh, four member genus called Zenagama that's got them. Um, it's got uh, Batillifera, which is called the beaver tail de gamma. Uh, you'll see them sometimes as well, but predominantly what you'll see in the trade are the ones that we have here today, which are shield tails. Uh, they are frankly the most interesting of the group. Oh, cool. Uh, there's, um, there's a lot of cool stuff going on uh, with that um, genus in terms of like their evolutionary history. It's like really distinct about how they sort of came into their native environment, which for shield tail de gammas, uh, they've got a pretty restricted range. Uh, they are endemic to inland Somalia, so think right bef right after that big uh, Ethiopian plateau. They're sort of set into that really sort of hot desert arid region uh, right uh, right after the plateau of Ethiopia and Somalia. Cool. All right. Describe, like, what is their tail? Why is it called a shield tail? Describe that yeah. and how big they are and, and kind of what they fact, look like. I've got a couple of them with me right now. Cool. So. What better way to show off what they look like than to show them off? <laughs> Take this little guy out. So this is an adult male. As you can see, they stay pretty small. Uh, and about three inches, maybe? Yeah, about three to four inches. Uh, the females get a little bit larger. Um, and you can right away see the namesake uh, of that really awesome shaped uh really unique shaped tail uh and the reason that they have that is these guys are super super avid burrowers it's mm. what they spend the majority of their time doing in their setups uh, and what they'll do as a defense mechanism is when they feel threatened they will dart around their tank and then go run into their burrows and they will plug up that hole with that neat, neat little shield right there so it's a lot you know, if you're a predator trying to grab at them, trying to grab at that spiky door that they just put in place, it's really difficult. Are they using that tail to make the burrow, though? Or are they using no, that to dig the, the, their got, claws? They've got these, uh, they got their little their little feet up front. Um, and it's probably really hard to make out, but their, their front feet in particular are very kind of like scoop shaped. Mm. Uh, so they're pretty adept at using those front little paws at uh, digging their burrows, which uh, to that end, um, it's been recorded out in the wild that these guys can dig uh, burrows as long as 20 feet. Oh, wow. So if you imagine this 
three to four inch little guy spending, you know, probably several, a week or two digging out that uh, 20 foot long burrow. Um, and that's going to become really important later on when we start talking about husbandry, because there's a very specific reason that they're doing that. Usually. Wow. That's really cool. That's mm-hmm. really cool. Now, that's how big they are full grown. Mm-hmm. How, how big are they coming out of the egg? They are super duper tiny when they first hatch. Uh, I think our Facebook has one of our most popular photos ever actually is when we first uh, hatched out some Taylor eye uh, in house uh-huh. and they, they, they basically fit on the first digit of your finger when oh, they wow. first hatched out. They're super tiny. That's amazing. So they do a little bit of growing. Uh, they usually hit adult age at around one and a half to two years old. So that's about how old this guy is. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. And then uh, how long do we guess that they're going to live? Like, what's a It's safe life? to estimate probably around 10 to 15 years on a cool. reptile about this size. Cool, cool, cool. Now, it seems pretty docile um, when you're holding them like that. Like, how quick are they? How, yeah. how, how darty are they? So handling these guys is not something that I do terribly often. Uh, they tend to sit pretty nicely for you in the hand. Uh-huh. Uh, but as I talked about earlier, um, their defense mechanism being to dart around the tank and to zip into their burrows. <laughs> uh, they basically do that anytime I open the enclosure. Mm-hmm. So they're really more of like a display slash like observe kind of animal, uh, but they do tolerate moderate handling like this. Uh, pretty much the second you want to go in and handle them, they're going to be trying to run away, trying to run away from you. They're pretty fast for how small they are. So. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. So once you got them, they're pretty easy to handle. They actually hold on pretty well. Uh, they're supposed to be terrestrial, but I find them climbing their backgrounds all the time. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's cool. Now the area that they're in is it pretty flat? Are they around some rocky? Uh, like, are they have areas that they can climb out in the wild? Do you think it's it's a uh, it's a fairly flat plain out there? Uh, so they again they're predominantly terrestrial. They will always I always recommend setting up like terrestrial reptiles with a decent amount of verticality, just because it's good for them to exercise and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Yep. Uh, but really, it's going to be surface area when you're thinking about an enclosure for these guys. It's really going to be like how like your length and depth is going to influence uh, how much space they're able to utilize you can cheat a little bit with verticality but they're not really that inclined to yeah. climb yeah, it's more so it's like i'm going to climb to get to another flat plane sort cool of thing so talk a little bit about how we set them up and and what are the things that we keep in mind when we're setting them up yeah um the f- The big thing, uh, the most important thing with these guys is getting a good substrate mix and having a ton of deep uh, digging media available for them. Uh, Again, burrowing is the number one thing that they like doing. And in order to keep them successfully, uh, they really do need a proper uh, moisture gradient. Uh, So I think, um, I don't know if I've necessarily talked about moisture gradients extensively for arid keeping yet. Uh, but for these ones in particular, uh, the reason that they're digging those super deep burrows, I mentioned earlier that they've been found to be as long as 20 feet deep. Yeah. Uh, they've also been found to be a couple feet deep. And uh, what the paper that I read about it notates is that their burrows always terminate in moist substrate. Mm. So they're digging like that predominantly because they're in a super dry desolate wasteland pretty much and they're digging down to find moisture and water so first and foremost uh super important is proper semi-arid substrate that's going to hold a good moisture gradient and i do not recommend doing anything less than four inches of substrate depth Mm -hmm. realistically for an adult uh shield tail agama six inches is going to be a lot more manageable it's going to give them a lot more options yep um, and after you got that covered, uh, pretty much just getting a decent sized enclosure going. Um, we're going to be moving them, most of our pairs up to 24 by 18 uh, by 12 exoterras soon here. But you could easily do uh, 36 by 18 for a pair and be doing absolutely right by them. Uh, they definitely like to run around and stuff. So the more area that they have to stretch out their legs, the better. Are they active during the day or are they more yes. active at night? This is a diurnal species of uh, lizard, uh, so they're going to be out during the day and doing their thing during the day. Uh, usually when I see them out, they're basking, so I'll go and do something in their enclosure and they'll go from their basking spot to a burrow, and that's mm-hmm. one of the 
like most common interactions yeah. I have with them. Talk about the basking spot. How warm are you looking to get? Yep. Um, and then uh, talk a little bit about too how you how you make multiple basking spots for those guys. Yep, uh, I aim for about 115 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're thinking about like setting up a basic basking site for a bearded dragon, a little bit more intense than that than in both heat and uh, UV. Because uh, these guys, I would comfortably classify as Ferguson's own four. Mm -hmm. So they're, not only are they going to want a little bit more intense heat, they're also going to want pretty intense ultraviolet light at their basking sites. Um, and I oftentimes will set that up with either ceramic or terracotta like pots and like sh uh, sheets of like tiles and stuff underneath there because that's going to be really good for both for both overhead and belly heat mm -hmm. it's going to get them uh heated up a little bit more quickly um and those terracotta pots too i use them all the time for yeah. a lot of my arid stuff because they're really good at heat retention they're actually really good for moisture retention too yeah they got uh obviously it's a pot so if you set it so that you got the flat surface for the basking spot they can go underneath there uh, and that's another way that they can bask is instead of if they don't want to like necessarily directly cook themselves, they can yeah. go underneath there and get more some more radiant heat going. Cool. Uh, so terracotta, terracotta pots are super useful for not only like basking platforms, but also just extra hides and yep. hides and stuff. How often are they basking? Do they they're spending most of their time in that basking spot? Are they roaming around pretty regularly as well? Yeah, I, I see. It's basically they'll go and they'll sit up and they'll bask for like 20 minutes to half an hour. And then they'll go like explore their enclosure and forage and stuff and then go back and then spend you know, usually about half hour or so doing that so they kind of go back and forth throughout the day between cool. basking and uh, foraging and exploring cool. cool um what are the things that we're feeding these guys at different points in their life like what are we feeding babies what are we feeding that guy yep so if you think about there, there's a lot of ways actually that these guys are kind of like tiny bearded dragons uh and diet is actually is absolutely one of them uh, when they're babies, they're eating predominantly insects, but I do er offer them uh, fresh greens and salads uh, as, as early as a week after they first hatched. But usually it's just like a little offering. They're mostly eating uh, insects mm -hmm. when they're babies. Uh, once they're adults, it switches more to a 50-50 ratio. Um Herbivorous diets are an entire topic for discussion, but yeah. uh, we do have... Um, I believe I linked a a good chart for what's appropriate to be feeding to herbivorous, herbivorous reptiles in our bearded dragon profile a while cool. back. Um, so if you look up any information like that for like bearded dragons of like what's safe to feed, what's like ideal to feed, as far as uh, salads go, you're gonna pretty much be able to translate that one to one with the uh, shield telegamas. The only difference being is that they're kind of eating; they're still eating more insect uh, protein material than uh, beardies are when they're adults. Mm. Um, and as far as insect feeders goes, I am mostly doing your standard fare of insect feeders like crickets and dubias and sometimes like mealworms, uh, waxworms are super fatty. So those are more of a treat item. Yeah. That sort of a thing. Now, how much food are those guys eating? Like at that size, like how much is he eating in a given week? Um, usually like uh, they get like a, like per week, they get like a dish of fresh greens and then I refill it, uh, like once or twice a week just to make sure that they have those fresh greens available. And then usually two, like one to two times a week, I'm throwing some more bugs in there for them. Cool. Uh, when they're young, they're definitely going to need to be fed way more often than that. Yeah. Uh, I'm feeding the, the, the babies like three times a week, but I'm like, they, basically it looks like a walking carpet of crickets in there. These guys are <laughs> super voracious eaters when they, when they uh, first hatch. That's cool. That's really cool. Now talk a little bit about breeding. How old are they when you're breeding them? Yep. How do you sex them, and, and what's the process? Um, when uh, when you're breeding these guys, uh, brumation cycling is absolutely essential in order to get uh, real pro uh, breeding production out of these animals, uh, and that's getting them as low as like 60 degrees during the day and 50 at night. So um, for about two months of the year, uh, they're going to need to they're going to need to experience that really uh, hard. Brumation cycle. Brumation is another thing that we can probably spend an entire podcast yeah. talking about because it's a really, uh, it's kind of scary when you first get into it, trying to like trust an animal <laughs> to make it through brumation, but it's what they're built to do. Yeah. But, Especially and, when you're talking about that hot spot of 115, and then you're like, and then you know, it's going like, to get to 60, yeah, half that temperature. It's like, yeah, you know, you want to keep them like 85 <laughs> degrees ambiently with a 120 basking spot for most of the time. And then for two months of the year, you want it to be 60. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, they need that two month formation period. That's going to get the females cycling their eggs. Um, and then that super deep, uh, moisture gradient, uh, substrate again is going to come in really important because that's what they're going to need in order to want to lay their eggs. Mm -hmm. Uh, they seek out, uh, that moist substrate again, and they typically seek out a soil temperature of about 85 degrees for egg, de uh, egg deposition. You can accomplish that via a lay box. Honestly, we've just been doing it uh, full viv nesting and it's worked out perfectly for us. Cool. They find exactly, it's a lot easier for them to find exactly the right spot to be putting their eggs in that way. So. That's cool. Now, now you talked a little bit about that gradient, especially it's, it's important with those eggs that you wanna keep them yeah. uh, moist. How are you adding water and adding the right amount of water to that substrate to, to give them that moisture gradient, but also to, to protect the eggs? Yep, pre right. um, so pretty much when I go to set up a new arid enclosure, I'm putting all of the moist, uh, all the substrate in moist. Like instead of, you know, trying to worry about doing like an actual gradient yet, I just make sure that it's all thoroughly moistened through, you know, not sopping wet, but definitely yep. holding as much water as it can. Uh, and then you usually, I'll wait a couple of days until the, that very that, like top layer of substrate dry, starts drying out. And then basically misting uh, whenever the first like quarter inch of substrate dries out. Oh, cool. So once you got that down, like it, it's kind it's, it takes a little bit of time to really get the hang of managing uh, like arid, uh, like, moisture levels and that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes I've had it where the substrate will completely dry out. In that case, you usually want to go through and basically just dump a bunch of water in there and re-soak it again. Yep. Um, but pretty much, like I said, it's, it's a lot simpler to just put it all in moist and then wait for it to start drying out and then just routinely misting uh, in order as you get uh, a decent amount of dryness in the enclosure for a day or two. So I'm usually misting these guys about two to three times a week at mm -hmm. that rate. Um, so yeah, that's the spark notes on, uh, maintaining semi-arid <laughs> substrate. Um, and also, uh, your mix is super important too. Uh, we're typically using, uh, we're mixing our own in-house right now for, uh, these guys. And we're typically mixing about like one parts play sand to three parts topsoil. You usually introduce a little bit of uh, Exoterra has a product called Stone Desert that we use, utilize uh, super frequently in our mixtures that helps with burrow retention, mm -hmm. uh, as well as um, a healthy amount of cocoa fiber in there allows for the substrate to be a little bit more aerated and yep. uh, easier for them to dig through. So that's cool. Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, semi arid mix to go for. And then, like I said, making sure that you're maintaining that moisture gradient so that they can shed properly and get all their water properly, as well as like we were just talking about uh, egg, de egg deposition is super important. Now, how long are those eggs? Uh... How long before they hatch? Yeah, uh, their eggs are actually really interesting because they only take about 30 days to hatch. Wow, that's which really fast. For reptiles, yeah, it's super fast. The trade-off, though, is uh, the females tend to hold on to their eggs for a really long amount of time. Huh. So they'll look super gravid and lumpy for like two months, huh. and then they'll finally drop their eggs. Interesting. So it's... Um, if when you're first starting to get into breeding these guys, you might think that they're having issues with like uh, egg, binding. egg binding, but it's totally not the case. It's just how they are. They just hold onto the eggs for a super long time, like inside of themselves. I imagine it probably has to do with their native range. If it's super dry and they're having to be super diligent about finding moist substrate like that, yeah, uh, moist media to bury their eggs in, it probably they probably want to be holding on to them for a long time so that makes they can sense. seek out those moist pockets. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, like I said, uh, they hold on to them like in their bodies for a good couple of months, but once they're ready, uh, the eggs take super, they, they hatch out like that. It's usually about 30 to 40 days is when I expect them to hatch cool. out. Now, are you keeping these in groups? Are you keeping males and females together year round? How do you uh, do we're keeping them in pairs right now. Um, you can keep them in harems, so like 1.3 or like one male to three females, you know. We've kept them in as high as like one male to five females. Mm -hmm. um, but what we discovered is uh, these guys are super uh, resource hungry. Mm -hmm. um, and if your enclosure is not large enough, if there's not enough food, if there's not enough basking sites, uh, there can be a decent amount of infighting pretty fast. Oh, so... 
we've gone back down to doing pairs for now. And now that we're increasing enclosure size, we might start exper experimenting a little bit more with that. Um, oh, now that I'm on the topic of uh, breeding groups, I should mention another super important thing for breeding these guys, and that's male competition. Uh, the males aren't really interested in breeding unless they are act actively competing with another male. Interesting. Um, but some uh, it's, it's kind of tricky because they can do a lot of damage to each other really fast. So what we've been doing actually is we'll keep like pairs together, but we'll keep the enclosures side by side and grant them visibility to the other tank. That way... Uh, they can actually see another rival male in another enclosure, but they're not going to be getting like directly involved with each other and beating each other up. Uh, and that's one of the coolest things about keeping the species, actually. Um, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how well it's showing up right now. You can see his beard, mm. uh, his underside of his mouth there is kind of shaded blue right now. Uh, when they're like um, in the heat of breeding season and trying to show off to females and males, uh, their chin right there just fully flushes this like iridescent purpley oh, that's blue. Cool. That's cool. It literally looks like they face planted into like a can of paint somewhere. <laughs> like I, the first time that I saw a photo of it, I thought it was photoshopped. And then you like work with them in reality. It's like, wow, that's like <laughs> that's just what they're doing. That is so cool. So it's like I said, one of the, the one of the coolest things about keeping them is watching the males during breeding season doing their thing. Like I said, they'll flare up on their beards fully blue. We've I think we got a photo or two of that too on our uh, our social media, um, and they'll sit up top on rocks and they'll like head bob and stuff and do all this cool uh, introspective combat behavior. But like I said, we keep males in separate tanks just so that they can't go and act actively fight. You probably could keep multiple males inside of one enclosure, but we're talking about doing an enclosure that's like six feet long at that yeah. point, so that. You know, they both kind of got their own little kingdoms with their own females and all their food and their basking sources and that kind of stuff. So when you're first trying to keep them as pets, I definitely don't recommend keeping males together. But um, regardless, uh, like I said, breeding, two biggest important things to get these guys breeding in captivity are that brumation period um, and letting the males do their thing in terms of like, uh, their dominance displays with, uh, rival males and such. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, on the scale of easy to very hard to keep, where would you put these and, and, and anything else that you'd like to us to keep in mind if we were, we're thinking about keeping these guys mm -hmm. as pets? Uh, since I real quickly, before I get to that, since I mentioned, uh, male females and like making sure that you're not keeping males together, I should probably briefly talk about sexing. Um, and that's really simple enough to do, actually. Um, again, I don't know how well this is showing up here, but uh, males develop a yellow waxy coating on their pores right above their tail. Huh. So that's how you can tell. And they actually will start showing uh, those secondary sex characteristics as early as two months old. Oh, wow. So I've been able to usually sex them around that age. Um, additionally, you'll usually get a little bit of bluing, uh, like just as a baseline in any of your males. But that can be kind of tricky because I've also seen females do it to an extent. Interesting. They don't flare up completely like the males do, but I typically rely more on the uh, the tail pores there, which... Yeah, this guy's basically got like Cheeto dust around his, shield, <laughs> around his butt. So that's Cheeto really, dust, I love it. That's really easy to tell. Um, to show off a female, what they look like. And this is actually really cool. One of our whole bag females. Uh, she's kept this really pretty red coloration. Yeah. So we're, we're really uh, excited to work with her and see where that goes. But if you look on her underside, she, you see that there's none of, none of the waxy yeah. coating down there. And. Um, yeah, I can't really see any of the blue flushing yeah, either. Again, I have seen it very occasionally with females. It's never, again, never to the extent that males do it. But, She's um, pretty. A lot of spikes on that shield. Yeah. Yep. Um, but anyways, uh, in terms of difficulty of keeping, I would definitely classify these guys comfortably as an intermediate like yeah. level difficulty. If you're a first-time caretaker and you're really diligent about research and yeah. getting the details right, you can be successful, but if you're worried about difficult of, difficulty of husbandry, I'd probably steer you towards a more classic beginner reptile. But realistically, yeah. once you get like those basic things right of like a good deep substrate that they can burrow in and the right temperatures and stuff, it's really that substrate that kind of puts them in the intermediate category mm -hmm. as well as just like herbivorous diets can be complicated. Yep. Um, 
But like I said, definitely, probably, comfortably an intermediate cool. level cool. species. Awesome. Brandon, thank you for educating us on uh, shield tails. They're really cool uh, species. Mm -hmm. I hope they come uh, much more uh, popular, much more readily yeah, available. Yeah, and I think that hobby. once we start exploring stuff like this with coloration, I've seen like I've seen this where like she's held on to her red really well. I've got a female or two that actually kind of flare up pretty yellow. So we're going to look more into that um, and try and that's see cool. if we can't hold back and select for it and see if we can't get some really nice looking individuals. Because that's another one of their things is um, they got some cool patterning going on, but yep. coloration wise, they tend to be a little bit more reddish brown mm -hmm. to like gray. Yep. So if we can get some nice colors going, that'll, I think that'll be a huge boost to their popularity too. Very right. pretty animals. Very mm -hmm. pretty animals. All right, Brandon, we're going to do a lightning round. I know you've done some of these before. Right. <laughs> so uh, hopefully uh, we remember your answers from last time or maybe they've uh, changed in some way. So if money and space were no issue, what uh, what are you keeping? What type of monitor is it going to be that you're going to be keeping? <laughs> um, Because hmm. I, cause I, I, I like typically keep smaller stuff in my collections because usually my issue is space more <laughs> space, than anything because yep. there's a lot of cool stuff to keep out there but you know you start you start looking into basically uh putting a, a zoo enclosure into your home and it <laughs> yep. starts to become a problem uh bell's phase lace monitors okay super cool super pretty animals uh they're super personable too uh, i've heard their personality they kind of tend to warm up a little bit sooner yeah. than some other verandas yeah. do Cool, cool. All right, besides Josh's frogs, what's another breeder or uh, company that's doing some really cool stuff with uh, yeah. products or animals? Uh, I feel like I got a shout out um, Cody Cop, uh, who his business handle is uh, Versatile Reptile. Uh, he's helped me out a lot um, since I've been trying to get into this tree monitor keeping cool. thing and a couple other things that I'm starting to work with at home too. Uh, he's been super helpful. He's super friendly. Uh, definitely will. He's got a wealth of knowledge and he knows a ton of people. So that's cool. That's cool. I love definitely people in our wanna, hobby that are interested yeah. in doing that kind and of stuff. And he's got some cool products too. Not just, uh, not just Persinus. He's got some, um, some cool 3d printed products, you know, oh, cool. like cup holders and stuff and some really nice looking, uh, prints that he's taken of some of his animals. Oh, that's cool. So a really cool business. I would definitely recommend checking him out. All right. Give us uh, what's your latest favorite plant or animal latest favorite plant or animal um i actually have started to put some uh we put some english ivy in a couple of my enclosures at home and it's actually taken really well uh because i've been using those uh those posable flukers vines for the longest yep. time but it's nice to have something that's like it, like you know that's what the actual vine is based off of is this plant yep uh, and they've taken really well actually and it provides a, a lot of nice coverage so oh, that's cool yeah. cool and it has some of the benefits of being a live plant yep that's cool all right you got an hour of free time no one's bothering you. They're just giving you giving your space. What are you doing with that hour? Uh, I've kind of just been binging YouTube a lot lately. Oh, fun. <laughs> fun. All right. Last question. Hardest question. You've got all of our ears. We're all listening and paying attention. What's one piece of advice mm -hmm. or one thing you'd tell us that, hey, just remember this? Yep. Uh, next piece of uh, Brandon sanctioned <laughs> advice would be um, I tell people, I talk about this all the time. Uh, when you agree to take uh, a living creature uh, into your home, it's not just like a nice piece of furniture yep. or a toy or anything like that. You're agreeing to take uh, a living creature yep. into your home. And we're learning more and more about uh, the intelligence of these animals. Uh, I mean, some of them can tend to be a little bit on the simpler side, yep. but by and large, I always feel like it's a lot safer to assume that they know more about what's going on than elsewise. So when you take uh, a, a herp into your home, uh, I just want to put out there, just recognize the level of responsibility yep. you're putting onto yourself. You get to go mm -hmm. out uh, out of your house and go around groceries and go to work and go on vacation yep. and that kind of stuff. Uh, that glass box is your pet's entire world. Yeah. So you want to make sure that you're doing the best by them that you possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. being honest about what you can give to your pets. 
Cool, cool. Thank you for educating us on these really cool animals, uh, Brandon. Uh, Brandon's a staple at Josh's Frog. You can see a lot of articles written by Brandon. Uh, a lot of social media posts um, come from some of his animals. Um, he's on a bunch of videos and that kind of stuff. So check out some of the stuff that he does. Thanks a lot, Brandon. Sweet. Have a good one. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. If you enjoy this content and want to stay up to date, make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us across social media. We always want to bring you the best content. So let us know if you, what you think in the comments. And for all your reptile and amphibian needs, be sure to check us out at joshesfrogs.com. We have an amazing selection. Until next time, stay curious, stay froggy, and keep exploring. <laughs>